Hi, everybody. Welcome um, to Empathy Day. And um, I'm Miranda McKerney from Empathy Lab. And I'm here with three pretty amazing people um, for the Empathy Conversation. And Empathy Lab's work blends approaches from the worlds of psychology, children's books and education. And I'm delighted to welcome such very fascinatingly cross-disciplinary panel. So we have the Children's Laureate with us, Cressida Cowell, much beloved for her very passionate advocacy of children's books and her totally gorgeous Train the Dragon books. And then we have Professor Robin Banerjee, who is um, Head of Psychology at Sussex University, um, active in very, very many important forums, um, including Welsh Government on their new curriculum, which has... Um, Empathy featured 39 times. And then Mohammed Khan, author of Kick the Moon, former maths teacher. Um, Kick the Moon was an absolute must have for our Read for Empathy collection. And um, we'll be hearing more about why later. So, Empathy Lab strategy is based on two key areas of research. Firstly, that empathy is a learnable skill. And secondly, that books are a potent tool to build it. And this is scientific research. And our vision is of a new generation of empathy skilled young people who are leading an empathy movement to create a very much better future. Empathy Day is one of our key programs and we founded it to spark a whole new conversation about why empathy is so important and how to help children explore, experience and practice it. And today has been just full of really inspiring children's contributions. It has made me feel very hopeful for the future and also very moved. So in this finale event, we're providing a, a reflective space, a space where we can all learn more about the psychology of empathy, the author's craft in building it, and how we can use stories more systematically to help children build amazing empathy skills and then put them into action. And goodness, what a time to be having an empathy day when the tectonic plates of society seem to be moving very fast right now. The crisis we're in, I hope, is also an opportunity the act of imagining ourselves in someone else's lockdown shoes has sparked a great burst of community at connection and kindness, and we really mustn't let that fade. Empathy is surely a foundation for a better society, a society that values everyone equally, and I don't see it as a fluffy thing at all. I see it as a vital tool in the fight against racism and a driver for radical social change. And we know we have to change and need urgently to mobilize, don't we? Because empathy is so often in horribly short supply as, eviden as evidenced agonizingly by George Floyd's death and here at home by the rise in hate crimes. So Barack Obama has a favorite quote of mine, which is empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. And in this conversation, we'll be exploring how we can use reading more deliberately to raise that generation of empathy skilled children. So we're gonna just start um, with a very quick sharing of our empathy boosting books because all day there's been the most massive crowdsource recommendations going on, buzzing around. So could I just ask our panelists to share theirs? Mohammed, what's yours? Okay, so my read for empathy recommendation is Rose Interrupted by Patrice Lawrence. It's a fantastic book about two siblings who um, have been excommunicated from a religious sect. Um, Rose can't wait to enjoy her freedom and Radha just wants to go back. Um, we don't often find YA books that deal with faith. Um, it's quite strange because I know that it's pivotal to the life of so many of my students. So I love this book and I think it's fantastic because it engenders empathy. Oh, that's a powerful recommendation. Thank you. Cresta, what is yours? My 
book is The Boy at the Back of the Class. Yay! By <laughs> Anjali Rao. I hope you can see it. Yeah, there. Um, and I just love this book. This is a beautiful, beautiful book um, about it, it. It's actually focusing. I mean, there's another wonderful book which I wanted to sort of mention as well. If you wanted the Ooh. other side, called Illegal by Owen Colfer, which is a graphic novel, and I often talk about um, graphic novels um, as a way in for a lot of children who struggle with, um, with with reading with dyslexia or something like that. Uh, anyway, Illegal is the is the story of the refugee story, and this is the refugee story as well. But it's also the story of the children who the young boy comes into the class of, and it's a, the, the young refugee, so it's, and they're trying to find out his story. And I, I love that two way, that two way where you're, you're telling the story of, of the boy coming in and his story, and uh, Ahmed's story, but you're also telling the story of the children who um, are welcoming him into, into their class. Mm. And it's, it's very, it's very heartwarming <laughs> it's a it's a really really moving story i love this one and the author Anjali Rav um with oh, Sita Brahmachari has been leading the most wonderful um empathy in action section of today robin what's yours my one is cloud busting by mallory blackman yay favorite <laughs> And uh, we know Mallory Blackman is uh, just such a fantastic supporter of Empathy Lab as well. And it really, really shows in this book, the power of empathy is just so strong in it. It's set in the context of children's peer relationships, which is what I've been studying for the last 25 years. And um, there's something in there that's so universal about the, the challenges and the complexities, the joys, but also sometimes the heartache that you can get in uh, children's peer relationships. And it's something I think we can all identify with, and it brings out the theme of empathy just so strongly. There's issues to do with difference. There's issues to do with um, respecting people who are not the same as you, not necessarily fitting into a kind of a cookie cutter mold of what people should be. Um, and I really like the way in which it kind of just really, it kind of a, uh, um, gets at something really deep inside you that we're all so familiar with that is all about connecting with each other um, yeah. and the, the the trials and tribulations that come with that so yeah. it's a really really emotional um, but in in the end actually such an importantly heartwarming read as well mm, wonderful and written all oh. in verse as well <laughs> yes i know i think it's a such an amazing book okay so thank you tonight's format is this, we have an hour to 8.15. Each panelist will start us off with some thoughts and then we'll have a discussion between them. And then around five to eight, eight o'clock, something like that, um, we'll take your questions. And if you do have any, um, please send them our way on Twitter using hashtag empathy day and here on Facebook um, in the comments section. So Robin, could I invite you to open things up for us. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for inviting me again. And it's just such an honor to be on a panel with such wonderful, wonderful people. Mohammed and Cressida, it's been an absolute joy to meet you both uh, today in this new virtual, very strange virtual world that we all inhabit now. Um, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for me to also just share with you what we've been doing for the last 25 years, which is learning more and more about children's relationships with each other, their social development, their emotional development. And empathy is just a huge part of that. And I think I wanna just open by saying how through the work that I've been doing and the conversations that I've had with people in Empathy Lab, we've learned so much about just why children's well-being is so critical. This is so relevant to the long-term development of every human being, to not just well-being and mental health, but also academic achievement, to work life um, for a long time to come through into adulthood, I don't think we ever stop learning about empathy. So, so what is empathy? Well, empathy manages to be, and this is why, you know, I've, I've said this to other people, em empathy manages to be simple and complicated at the same time. So the reason it's complicated is because I don't think it's right to think of empathy as just one thing. It's not a simple um, 
uh, unidimensional construct, whether you're where you're either high or low on empathy, actually, it's got three different components to it. And all those three components work together. There's an emotional dimension, which is all about sharing other people's emotions, that affective connection that we have with other people. But there's also a really important thinking part to it. That's the cognitive empathy. It's about understanding emotions. Why is someone feeling a certain way? What is it that made someone feel a certain way? And as well as the emotional part and the cognitive part, there's a third part, which is a motivational part, what you might call an empathic concern. Not only might you feel something when you see that someone else is in distress, not only might you have a good understanding of what's going on, but also to be really empathetic, there needs to be this third motivational component, which is you've got to care about other people's feelings as well. You've got to want to help other people. And so we've got a situation where all these three ingredients in empathy need to come together to produce what we regard as empathetic behavior. So if you see someone behaving in a way that's quite empathetic, actually what's going on underneath is quite complicated. You've got quite a lot of things going on. But the reason I said at the beginning that I think it's as well as being complicated, also simple, is that there is, I guess it comes back to that word universal, there is that simplicity to it in that it's very human. It's the way we connect with each other. And that human connection is fostered by our empathic characteristics, by understanding emotions, by feeling and sharing others' emotions, and by caring about others' emotions. That's where it really comes from. And we know that this is something that develops in childhood right from the very beginning, from the word go, really. We know that it develops when children are babies, they're already learning to tune in to each other. They're learning to tune in to human beings. And that grows and grows as they get older. And of course, it won't be long before we start seeing uh, very uh, young infants. And it's always cute when you actually observe toddlers doing little helping behaviors and responding to other people's emotional characteristics as well. We really see children tuning in to other people's facial expressions, to what's going on for other people. We really are such social creatures. But the important thing about the development of empathy is that it's not the same for everybody. And we know that the environment plays a role in the development of empathy. Empathy isn't, what shall I say, it's not a, it's not a fixed quantity. It's not that every person is born with a certain pot of empathy and that's it, that's what you've got, mate. Actually, there's a huge amount of learning that takes place. Children don't come uh, ready-made with empathy that's just there as a fixed quantity for the rest of their lives. They're learning from their environment constantly. And you know what? I would say that process goes on throughout life. It's there throughout childhood for sure, but it carries on into adolescence. It carries on into young adulthood. It carries on all the way through your life. And I think the, um, the reason why I'm so excited about the partnership uh, with Empathy Lab is that um, Empathy Lab is bringing together this kind of scientific notion of empathy, really trying to understand what it involves, with the basic idea that this very ubiquitous experience that we have of reading, sharing books with each other, can produce something really, really magical. And I think that's so exciting. Books are around us. And sometimes I think we have to really protect that status. And I think the work that people like you, Cressida, and you, Mohammed, are doing is absolutely invaluable for making sure that we hold on to these um, really important things around us. Because when a parent is reading a bedtime story with their children, when you have two friends at school who are talking about what they encountered in a book that they read, when you have an adult who's sharing what they read over the weekend with someone else, actually those conversations are taking the empathy building character of books and taking it to a new level. Because when we connect socially with other people around books, it becomes even more powerful. And it's like what you said, Miranda. I'm, I mean, I think this year... I mean, I'll let other, if we can talk about it more, I'll let other people um, just comment on this, but it feels to me like empathy and potentially the vehicle of books to foster and engender that growth in empathy has never, never been more important. 
So I'm just so excited to be here. Um, we've learned so much about empathy and how it can be built through reading. In our own research studies, we've actually found that children have been able to develop their empathy skills, both the emotional aspects of it and the cognitive aspects of it through reading. And I think what we've seen throughout today just looking at the examples of what we've seen on Twitter today is that third element as well, that motivation, the translation of empathy into action. It's just such an exciting combination for me. Um, and uh, I'm just really happy to be part of it. And I'm so looking forward to hearing from Cressida and Mohammed about their perspective on how books can be uh, harnessed as a really powerful force to build that empathy. So just so pleased to be with you both. Well, Robin, whenever I hear you talk, I wish I was a student at Brighton University, uh, University, University of Sussex, that being, yeah. having wonderful psychology lectures. Yeah. Um, thank you. We'll hear much more in a bit. Mohammed, would, could we hear from you now? Of course. Um, really difficult to follow up on that. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mohammed. As both an author and a teacher, I have seen the important role books play in instilling empathy in young people. Emotional, cognitive, compassionate are the three aspects of this vital skill, which can be learned at any age. Learning outcomes across the board improve when there is a strong sense of community and the stakes for failure are lowered. In short, creating a safe space through empathy brings out the best in everyone. I often quote Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop's metaphor about children's books being like mirrors, windows and sliding doors. For those who haven't heard her genius quote, she compares books to mirrors which reflect the reader's own life and provide affirmation. With windows, you're looking at someone else's house, seeing how your life matches up to theirs. With sliding doors, you are fully immersed in someone else's way of life, walking in their shoes, seeing and experiencing the world as they do. What better way to promote shared values and not just intercultural tolerance, but an avid appreciation for it? That is the inherent, inherent power of books. Britain has been multicultural for decades, yet inequality still endures. A spotlight has been shone on this with the untimely death of George Floyd. But Britain has its own problems with cases like those of Mikey Powell and Darren Cumberbatch. Black people represent 3% of the population, but account for 8% of deaths in police custody. Shukri Abdi was a 12 year old refugee who died last year and justice still has not been served. If we don't talk about these issues, even if they make us feel uncomfortable, we can never hope for true equality. This is why I think it's so important for us to read stories by black, Asian and minority ethnic writers, to provide representation for those we traditionally don't hear from. It's not sufficient to have a tick box for one Asian writer, one black writer, one LGBT writer because that places a huge burden on those few writers to be all things to all people. Even within a single community, there are different experiences and opinions enjoyed by members of that community. Those nuances are beautifully brought to the fore by own voice authors. They speak from the lived in experience. After reading Kick the Moon, many children told me they felt seen. In fact, some of them said they wanted to be in a live screen adaption of it. In Kick the Moon, the vast majority of characters are Asian, yet their outlook on life is quite different. Even within a single family, we see that variety reflected. Ilias's older brother is on his way to Harvard to study business management. His 17-year-old sister is carving a career out of herself as a YouTube influencer. His own passion is comic books, but he's afraid he doesn't measure up to the rest of his family, a feeling shared by many young people. Then we have Imran, who is trying to navigate through life after his father walked out on his family. He creates a hyper-masculine identity for himself in an attempt to prevent being put in a position of vulnerability ever again. He compounds this by forming a gang based on the tenets of toxic masculinity. There's a them and us mentality at work, a dividing of community and a fierce anger that stems from feelings of being left behind. It's a window into what stokes the fires of gang culture among teens. And finally, we have the core hijabi maths teacher, Miss Muggle, who is very much encouraging Ilias to be brave and forge his own path. Though she comes from a STEM background, she tells him the arts are just as important. From a cultural point of view, this, huge, this holds huge significance. Some children of Asian and African descent have told me that their parents want them to become 
doctors or engineers or lawyers. Ms. Muggle affirms that all of our natural talents are important and worthy of nurturing. It's a message I could have done with as a child. Kick the Moon is not just for Muslim kids or Asian kids, but for everyone to enjoy. When we read about a character from a different culture or gender or ability from our own, we learn the skill of perspective taking and understand how our lives are all interconnected. We've recently seen the power of empathy in bringing diverse communities together during the global pandemic and the Black Lives Matter protests. While some politicians have been busy trying to assuage blame, communities have stepped up to support our most vulnerable, to show appreciation for, the, for NHS staff and to campaign together for an end to racism. Once the pandemic is under control, we must continue to support all communities with the same kindness and compassion. We must continue listening to them. The empathy we develop from reading will ensure the important messages learned are never forgotten. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. That's, oh, well, we'll come back to all of that. So <laughs> thank you. Cressida, now you. Oh, well, it's already really fascinating. Bringing that <laughs> really fascinating. Uh, um, yes, absolutely. I'd agree with both of you so much. This is, well, all of you. We've never needed this wonderful skill of our empathy more um, than we do now. Um, uh, and when I, I became Children's Laureate, my, my speech centred around these words, reading is magic and magic is for everyone. Um, kids, I tell kids that reading gives you three magical powers, creativity, intelligence and empathy. And empathy is in many ways the most important because it's the one that links you with your community. And if you have creativity and intelligence alone, then frankly, you're just a very creative, intelligent villain and we need less of those rather than more. Um, but I was delighted to be asked to be speak, speak at Empathy Day because empathy and trying to see things from other people's point of view is not only a theme running through all of my writing, but one of the reasons why I write books in the first place. Um, I think books are particularly book, good at, uh, at bringing empathy out from children. I often get asked why um, whether I wanted to write the How to Train Your Dragon movies, and obviously I'm very proud of those movies. Um, uh, but my answer uh, has always been that writing books for children is my own uh, personal quest because of the unique capacity of books to encourage empathy and creative thinking. And I think this is because things on a screen happen out there, but in a book they are happening inside your head. You are that person. Uh, the best, best way I know to climb into somebody else's skin and walk around in it, to quote Atticus Finch from Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. You can be given endless history lessons on World War I, but when you read a book, you are poor old private peaceful walking out to the front. Um, and a few books, I wanted to talk about a few books that really opened my eyes that were like, um, as Mohammed talked about, um, uh, windows or sliding doors for me when I was a child, um, which really inspired me to become a book writer. One was called The Endless Step by Esther Hautzik. And I was read that by a teacher, a teacher, lovely Miss Danishevsky read that to me when I was a, a nine-year-old uh, and our whole class um, at school. And it was about another nine-year-old, a little nine-year-old girl whose family were sent into exile in Siberia. Um, during the Second World War. And, and that, that experience of having that book read aloud about another life, another, another world, really opened my eyes to a, a way of uh, somebody else's, you know, somebody else's experience. Um, I Am David was another one um, by Anne Horn about a boy escaping from a concentration camp. And a more humorous book, very different uh, take on empathy, but equally important for me, was uh, Freaky Friday, um, which was about a teenager who turns into her mother um, and again that's a that that's about um a, a personal relationship but seeing things from her mother's point of view and another one called the 12th day of july by joan lingard about two children growing up oh, on yeah. the side of the divide in northern ireland and they were all books that made you think about what it might be like to live in somebody else's shoes a book is an empathy exercise in itself and i'm a 
big believer in reading for the joy of it and that a book is worth a thousand spelling tests. Um, so it's no coincidence that in the case of the two heroes of my series, um, two series, which are um, um, How to Train a Dragon and Wizards of Once, Wish and Hiccup, their superhero powers are creativity, intelligence and empathy. So Stoic Hiccup's father is of the generation when he comes across a problem, he punches it. Whereas Hiccup and Wish use their powers of creativity and empathy to think their way out of difficulties. One of the major turning points in How to Train Your Dragon series is in book 11, when you have this villain character, um, Snotlout. And this is uh, something that I uh, love doing in, in books. And I love it when I come across it in book. A villain character, Snotlout, who suddenly you see in book 11, you see his point of view, Hiccup sees his point of view. Um, and I, I, that's one of the ways that I try and encourage children to um, look, look through other people's eyes. And I also try and use specific writing techniques to get them to think in different ways. So the language of Dragonese, which is a, a language that you can learn in how to train your dragon, on the face of it is just a way to be funny or to, um, to make them laugh. But many of the words give you an insight into a dragon's eye view of the world. So they invite you to see things from a dragon's point of view. Mice are squeaky snap. Human beings are no brains. Dogs are dim woofs. Um, and these are all ways of you looking, uh, or the child being invited to look at um, things from a dragon's point of view, um, encouraging empathetic um, thinking. And in The Wizards of Once, the whole premise is, is, a, is, is structured around empathy. Wish and Zara are from different tribes who have been taught to hate each other from birth. Um, so when they meet in the forest, their first instinct is not to be friends. They have to learn to work together towards a common goal. And this doesn't always go smoothly, like relationships in real life, um, their adventures, you know, together, um, it, it's a learning experience. Empathy, as we've been said, is a, is a learned skill. Um, and together, hiccups are and wish have to question a lot of the assumptions and teachings about each other's tribes. And the great thing about magic is that you can quite literally put your characters through empathy exercises, such as when Zara and Bodkin drink a magic potion that makes them change places with each other in not three times. And, um, and therefore, they literally have to see things from each other's point of view. Um, two of the points on my Waterstones Children's Laureate Charter are that every child has the right to see themselves reflected in a book, and every child has the right to access advice from a trained librarian or bookseller. This is so important because these are people who can help children access a wide variety of books about different people and different experiences. This world we live in today has so many challenges. We need children to be more creative, more intelligent, and more, most importantly, more empathetic than ever before. And I'd like to say again, like Miranda, empathy is not a soft skill. It's a vital tool that our children need and books are one of the best ways for them to develop it. Mm. In The Wizard of Once, there's a magical spelling book that can fly. It flies like this. Um, books really can do that. And I'm echoing Mohammed here. Um, books really can do that. They can fly across continents. You can fly back in time. But even more importantly, a book is a window into somebody else's soul. As Mohammed said, we open that window or open that door into somebody else's heart. That is what is so important. And the more books you read, the more lives you lead. So I'm back at the beginning again. Reading is magic and magic is for everyone. It's transformative magic. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Cresta. <laughs> Thank That's you. Brilliant. That's just wonderful. And I'm very struck by um, how you writers are just naturally doing through your craft some of the things that Robin, you talk about when you talk about how do we build children's empathy skills and very specific things like you both talked a lot about perspective taking. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear more thoughts on how we really, let's dig a bit deeper into how we can really develop this skill in children. 
can I can I ask a question first of all? You can. Um, um, just first of all, Mohammed and Cressida are absolutely brilliant, and I'm blown away by those really beautiful ways of expressing um, the 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 power and magic of uh, um, empathy in books. It's just so beautiful. Um, one of the things that I'm wondering about is what it's like, and this is a, this is going to be a hugely naive question, but what it's like from a writer's perspective in terms of creating the characters in the first place. So what happens to your empathic relationship with your characters? Is it there from the beginning or does it develop as you begin to write the stories of the characters? I'm just curious to know what your experience has been. Do you want to start, Cressida? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I put a lot of myself into the characters, so that happens quite naturally um, without really intending to do that. So, uh, you know, I don't set out to say, right, I'm going to get write a character just like me, but um, uh, I put a lot of myself into, into Wish or into Hiccup. Um, so, so, so that happens quite naturally but I find I find myself quite empathetic to even some of the characters who are more villainous I don't know. <laughs> and, and some of that is um, some of that is intentional like with Stotlight I was so that he becomes uh, you know he, he I'm intending for you to try and see um, things from his, his point of view in the end Sometimes even with the characters who are irredeemable, um, I can feel myself being quite empathetic towards as well. Um, uh, but there are a few who I just can't empathise with at all. Um, but mostly I find it, I, I find I, I am empathetic. It's very difficult to write, I think, without, um, it, to bring things to life without inhabiting the characters in some way. Would yeah. you say that was... was it, of your writing as well? Um, no, mine's different. Um, I don't think I could write if I wasn't a teacher um, because I am a secondary maths teacher, um, not because of the maths, but because I'm a secondary teacher. I'm surrounded by all these wonderful children and they all have such different personalities and some of them immediately want to learn and some of them don't. But I found that the more you get to know them, the more they are willing to kind of give you a chance and give your subject a, a chance, and then you get better outcomes for them. Um, and as they grow to like your subject, they also kind of grow to like you as well. They see you both um, as, you know, just linked together. They begin to tell you things about themselves. And sometimes else, you know, a child who for half a term has not really engaged with maths and be messing around, suddenly things will click for them. And then they're the ones who stay after school and they want to keep talking to you about their life and other things. And you just discover so much about them. And sometimes I've had teachers say to me, um, how do you manage to control your classes? Because you're quite slight and small and very softly spoken. But it's, for me, it's not about disciplining them. It's about getting them on side the way to do that is to show that you're genuinely interested in their lives and who they are and what uh, what they think is important um, because there are so many issues. Obviously, the world is so full of issues at the moment, but for a child or for a teenager, they're experiencing things far more than we do. And there are so many stimuli all over the place and it's difficult for them to make sense of it all. So when you form this strong relationship with them, they begin to kind of discuss these things with you. And one of the things I really enjoy is when I have a tutor group and they'll talk amongst themselves. And that's when they do the perspective taking. Mm. And from that, you learn so much. And that's where my characters come from. I guess I cheat. I kind of take some of their personalities and put them together to create a new person. And um, yeah. <laughs> So not as creative as Cressida, unfortunately. But I think there's hey, something... There's, 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 I do that too. I, I, I do I that as well. Was... Let's hear from Cressida and then Robin, would it be lovely to hear from you. Cressida. 
Oh no, I was just I was just following up on the habit saying no. I do that as well. You take characteristics of people that you know, and you, they become a diff. They then take on a life of their own, and they become their own character. Fictional, I know, but they then feel like a real character. I I feel like the characters are real, even though. But, but often the starting point is somebody you remember from school, or in your case, a, a pupil of yours that you're working with, or um, you know. Um, Zara is the kind of kid who, who is, means well, but um, is always getting into trouble. And I remember a lot of kids like that at school, you know. Um, uh, and so you take something from somebody else. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how the things that you were saying, Robin, about, about, about the, um, firstly, how young these things develop. I'm really interested in, 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 in babies, for instance, mm. how you can encourage babies to be empathetic and I suddenly as you were talking I was thinking of a little book series called Wibbly Pig yeah and they were it was about a little pig and there were about seven or eight books and they were all little stories but the one that all my babies focused on very young was one book called Wibbly Pig is Upset mm. and it was about Wibbly getting upset and he, he gets upset because he drops his ice cream <laughs> you know it, it's at that level the problem's quite easily solved <laughs> you know Wibbly <laughs> is made happier by getting the ice cream um, but it was really interesting how little the children how very young um children babies you know they really focused in on that one particular book and they were really upset for Wibbly, you know, yeah. <laughs> the pig lost his ice cream. They could empathize with that. It's and I thought that was really interesting how young. And so you one way I suppose that we can, that was one thing I was thinking as you were talking, Robin, is, is remembering how, you know, even reading with stories like that with very, very little babies that you think are too young to understand a concept of empathy. Actually, maybe they can. Children are often smarter, younger. And the other thing, I, I, I suppose that I was I, I, I just was thinking was um, how how interesting how interesting how important it is that we just re read as many different books from as Muhammad was saying from as many different authors as we possibly can from as many different voices as we possibly can and expose our children to as many different voices as we can. You know what, what was interesting just hearing you both talk just now was that really profound point of actually feeling like you're making a connection with someone else and you're getting to know them and that business of getting to know a character to really know a character to understand where they're coming from to see what their life is like and make a sort of a point of connection with them that seems to me to be a really profound point and it's like as i said my my background is in um um uh um, social and emotional development and that's become a really big focus in schools there's a lot of work to try to build social and emotional skills um, in the school setting um, and there are tons of fantastic lesson plans and resources out there to help uh, schools to um, structure activities to foster the development of these different skills but it's not a simple matter of a teacher just standing up in front of a class and say, right, I'm going to teach you all how to be empathetic today. Actually, you've got to create the conditions which foster empathy. And what you were both saying to me just now or saying, saying to each other just now was that really important point about actually wanting to get to know someone else, to go past the surface, to go past the two dimensional appearance of someone and really understand them as a person. And of course, that isn't just a matter of a lesson plan or a resource that a school teacher is using in a PSHE class, even though there's some really fantastic uh, resources out there there's something really fundamental that's operating at a human level as well. And I always say that in the school context, you've got the um, formal activities, the structured activities that are happening in class. But I think equally important, or maybe even more important, are the informal everyday activities that happen when you're in any class. It could be like, like you were saying, Mohammed, in a math class, or it could be in a PE class or a drama class or a history class. In any class, or outside of the academic context as well, just those informal everyday interactions where people are bothering to get to know you. 
people are making that effort to connect with you as a human being. And I think that's what so many books really convey powerfully. And I think, you know, the examples of uh, the Wibbly Pig that you just gave uh, Cressida, as well as your own uh, Kick the Moon, Muhammad, they're just perfect examples, of course, with different age groups, um, different audiences, but they're just perfect examples of in simple or more complex ways, pushing past that two dimensional barrier and getting to know someone else as a three dimensional human being. And I was very struck, Mohammed, by we've, we've thought a lot this empathy day about how important authors are as role models um, for children. And so there's been these incredible authors leading all the activity for empathy day. But Mohammed, I was very struck um, about how you, in teaching, you were talking about role modeling empathy. And I thought that was extraordinarily powerful. So as well as being a writer, doing it through your writing, you're also doing it through your teaching, which is, you know, extraordinary kind of double hit. <laughs> and, so the, the things, um, Robin, that you often talk about, about empathy in education and empathy through books in education much more um, using that much more systematically mm. sort of really fitted with what both Mohammed and, and Cresta were saying. Absolutely. I've got to ask you the question, Mohammed. You know, you were talking about how you're connecting with the students in your class. Has, has that idea been spreading with the other teachers around you after you talk with them or is that a difficult difficult kind of a um a skill to develop i'm just just wondering about how do teachers respond to each other in that context um it's it's funny really because like every teacher has their own strengths and they teach to those strengths so um myself and another teacher we might end up with the same results uh, or rather our students end up with the same results. But the way we go about fostering that is a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the only teacher who kind of goes down the empathetic route, um, but I know I've got some colleagues who are fantastic disciplinarians and it works for them and the students really respect them and are grateful for you know, the way they teach. But my teaching style is different. I don't like to be, I mean, I can't because I've I'm not particularly scary to look at anyway. So um, I couldn't be a disciplinarian. So we make the most of what we have. And I find that I enjoy teaching maths a lot more if I have everyone on site, if they're having just as good a time as I am. And unfortunately, maths is a subject that, you know, is thought of as dear, austere or, you know, kind of difficult to relate to. So what I do is I actually do what Miss Muggle does, which is I bring in a lot of celebrities or stories or films, and I try to weave them into the lesson. And I try to make the lesson into a story with a beginning, a middle and an end. And I think actually that's something that primary school children do, or primary school teachers do so well. Back at primary school, they teach through stories and the outcomes are fantastic. And for some reason, when students come to high school, it suddenly becomes very serious and you don't have that warmth and that empathy anymore. But for me, um, I don't think I could teach without trying to relate to those students, without gauging them and trying to, you know, find out what they're interested in and bringing those into the class. Um, and similarly with, with my books, I listen to what they're talking about because I'm not a teenager. I haven't been a teenager, teenager for a very long time. So it has to come from them. And if it's important to them, it becomes important to me because I can't teach lessons otherwise. And then I want to put them in books so it opens up the conversation to a wider audience. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. It um, it's time for questions. This, this doesn't feel like nearly long enough. I know. <laughs> but um, we're going to invite Laura from Empathy Lab to join us. Um, and Laura's been collecting, I hope, the questions that have been coming in. So Laura, do you want to chuck our panellists some questions? Yeah, there's been some really, really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to um, open up the floor for these two questions. So uh, both are very topical at the moment. The first one, Pig Rawlings commented that it is interesting that the youth are experiencing empathy due to the social media exposure to the tragic death of George Floyd. 
could the panel discuss how the Black Lives Matter movement um, and its presence on social media relates to empathy? That's the first. Um, and then the second question um, is Kate, from Katie, who is um, a pupil in one of our partner schools in Wales. Um, and she talks about the uh, pandemic at the moment. She says, do you have any ideas for empathy boosting social distance games or activities we can do with pupils in school? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two very different questions. Who would like to start? Well, can, can I say something about um, the first one? Because it's something that is really important to me and uh, I'm sure to everybody on the panel. Um, we're in such a such uh, an extraordinary situation where so many different things have come together in 2020 um, and I think we're all kind of reflecting on our lives and on society and we're to me it feels like okay maybe it's not a guarantee but I feel like there's a tremendous potential that this is a turning point. I really do. It feels like there's a potential for this to be a turning point. I think empathy does have a really big role to play here. And to my mind, when we um, start talking about the um, hugely important uh, work that's being uh, carried around all across social media and of course in everyday life and all the extraordinary and powerful protests that we've been seeing around the world, there's something in there which seems to me to be about the boundary between self and other, which is dissolving, where we're beginning to recognize that actually the categories that we put ourselves and other people into, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes not even in a kind of a blatant or explicit way, but we do it, that those things we're beginning to ask ourselves, actually, what do these mean? Are we really separated from these other categories and is it the case that the people who are in our category deserve more of our attention than the people who are in whatever we've called the other category and it seems to me that what's being powerful here is we are actually engaging in real time right now in a very very powerful process of perspective taking where we're really trying to understand each other and it's not easy because of course we don't share each other's history but we're finding a human connection and recognizing something in kind of a universal sense about either the horrors that have occurred in the past and are still accumulating every single day um, in the black community and how they connect with our lives and how we can't just separate ourselves off and say, actually, you know what, that is other. That's beyond the boundary. That's a different, that's a different category to me. It's not my problem. I'm not going to think about it. and say, actually, you know what? It's our, it's our problem. It's all of us because we are um, human beings and we're connecting with each other. And I think empathy has such a powerful role to play in it. I don't know if that really made sense to you, but I think there is something very powerful about the self versus other and how that's shifting at the moment. I think empathy has got a role to play in that. I'm always so interested to hear the psychologist kind of take on things. Mohammed, would you like to say anything on this? Um, I just want to say that one of my resolutions was that I um, wanted to do more listening than talking. And I think it's really important at this point in time that we listen to what black people are saying. Um, I'm a person of color and I have experienced racism, but it's going to be a different perspective from what black people are saying. And this has been boiling away for a very, very long time. And it's a shame that's had to get to this stage where people are so angry, they're having to protest and you know, there's heightened tensions. But this has been ignored for far too long. So I'm really glad that it's finally being forced upon people that we have to have this discussion now and we can't go back to the way things were before. We've got to make things fairer. Cresta. And, and Robin, are you thinking that, th that it's actually the pandemic that has made people have that joined experience that, that you are hoping, and I'm instinctive, my goodness, I am hoping with you that that joint experience will make people more likely to empathize empathize and and this is that these two things are related or are you thinking that it's just 
this is one, you know, one, you know, people are just beginning to to feel that this has got to change. Unrelated. Well, to you know, it, it's really but difficult. I want to, I want to believe that things are going to change. I want to believe, and you have to travel. Hopefully, you have to look at you know the past and you know Gandhi and you know other you know thing you know moments that happened that where things did change and hope that this is going to be one of them and that this is this is this is you know got to, I, I always want to travel hopefully yeah absolutely i mean you know we've got a we've got a whole constellation of different factors which are coming together in 2020 it does seem to be a really momentous year and you know i wonder in the future what historians and every you know in everyday life lay people what people are going to make of 2020 is just a um, you know in in it feels as we're living through it that we're going through an extraordinarily um uh, turbulent uh time when some very important things are happening. And I think uh, what Mohammed said about the importance of listening during this time is absolutely crucial. As to the question of the, the pandemic um, at the moment and what that's doing, I think there is a real challenge about how we connect with other people during this time, because if we all think about ourselves in a very individualistic way and we think what's happening for me, what's the impact on my life? If we don't, if you like, have that, allow that blurring of the boundary between self and other if we only think in terms of what is it the impact for me right now then I think the whole experience would be totally different um, and I think in some cases that's you know in in recent uh, recent weeks that's been one of the big things that we're thinking about are we considering the world from an empathetic perspective where we're thinking about all of us as being in the same space as human beings, even though we have dramatically different histories, dramatically different life circumstances, that we're all human and we've all got that connection in place? Or are we just prepared to put up walls around us? And we know that in recent affairs, uh, recent current affairs, there's a, um, a whole thing about people putting, literally, putting walls up around them. And I think one of the one of the difficulties, um, you know, Mohammed, you were saying that it's kind of been a long time coming um, and we should have been able to deal with this um, sooner. And I completely agree with you about that. What, one of the interesting things about it, though, is if you look at the kind of society that we have, I think, and this this is very much comes through in child development work, so much of what we do in supporting our own children's development is about helping them and encouraging them explicitly sometimes to carve out their own identity, to be an individual. Who are you going to be? How are you going to prove yourself? Whether it's proving yourself in exams or getting the right qualification or getting the right job, um, looking the right way, having the right stuff is all about you as an individual. And sometimes I think that carries a risk. It makes people put up walls around themselves and once soon as you put walls up around yourself, then there's a real problem because you don't pay attention to the needs and concerns of other human beings. You're only focusing on people like yourself, the people who you allow into your through or through your wall. So I think maybe the pandemic and certainly I think the the outrage that we all share at the moment in relation to the um, really atrocious brutal police killings of uh, black people um, including George Floyd I think I think what that might be doing at some level is making us at least think about the walls that are around us and think about maybe taking some of those bricks down and making connections with other people oh what a rallying cry that is um guys I'm Oh, we're running out of time, and I we must answer Katie's question. Laura, could you just remind us what it was? Yeah, of course. So it's from Katie from one of our partner schools in Wales, and she says, do you have any ideas for empathy boosting, socially distanced games or activities we can do with pupils in school? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> can, I leap in? can I leap in and say, <laughs> I'm going to cheek but I'm gonna Ruth I'm gonna say books reading books with children I mean th this is what this is all just sort of um uh 
solidified in my mind, you know, absolutely what Robin was saying about um, how, what happens with empathy, how, how, how you have to experience what it like, might be like to be somebody else, but then you have to act on it. That is why I love Anjali's boy at the back of the yeah. class so much, because the children in, in the classroom act on their empathy to Ahmed, you know, and, and that's all presented in not a sort of lectury way to a child. Yeah. It's just presented as a joyful thing as they're enjoying the book. Um, so books are very complex, wonderful things that can address all of these things that we've been talking about in a joyful way that children can absorb without feeling they're being told. So I would say, I am cheating a little, but I would say that's the, the best empathy building exercise you can do. And I'm always trying to say, you know, teachers, please, because I know, uh, Mohammed, you were saying at primary school, you know, children get, you know, not every child, you know, many teachers have are so pressed for time that they don't have that time in their schedule to read 10 minutes, you know, with their class, even let alone a day, maybe not even in a week, you know, and I'm just, I'm just trying to say it, it can be so valuable that just act of, of reading a book. You know, you, you've talked about it, Mohammed, even with older children, with secondary school children, that act of sharing a book can be so important in building this empathy um, and in children learning and, 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 um, uh, and, you know, developing their intelligence as well and their creativity as well as their empathy. So, so, so read. Katie, yeah. <laughs> Katie, I, I think you have your perfect answer. Oh, this is, um, I feel like, okay, let's go, all of us, everybody on Facebook, everybody here, go away for a weekend and have a, a real chew through these issues. It, um, yeah, really big stuff. So I, I need to start to draw things to a close um we're getting towards the end of our hour but i can't end without doing two things and this is very relevant to what we've just been talking about which is um how are we going to all of us and encourage the children in our lives to put empathy into action and one of the things that Anjali was doing at the end of Empathy Day with Sita Brahmachari was sharing empathy resolutions. And they've been going up in windows everywhere. Um, mine is, um, I don't know if you can see it, to listen 100%. Um, I find it really difficult to listen 100%. I'm always trying to do a million other things at the same time, and I'm always far too busy dispensing advice. And so I'm really going to practice listening 100%. And in a minute, I'm going to ask these three for their empathy resolution. So I just wanted to share, there's been so many amazing ones coming through from children. And there was one I really liked, I think it was from Wales, was be an empathy hero. Listen, I'm going to listen to others, understand others' feelings and never look down on people. And that's oh. like, that is that empathy generation. Those kids, they're amazing. So, Mohammed, what is yours? Okay, mine is slightly greedy in that I've got three. <laughs> That's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> my first resolution is um, grocery shopping for my elderly neighbours, and I've already started doing that. Um, my second one is donating to our local food bank. Um, and my third one is doing more listening and less talking, which I've already mentioned. So similar to you, Miranda. Yeah. Are we allowed to talk to each other, though, sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> Just occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Robin, what is yours? Oh, well, mine, mine follows on really nicely from what, um, what you said, Miranda, and what Mohammed said at the end about listening um, uh, more or talking less. Um, mine is tune in. You know what I was saying earlier about how children learn to tune in um, to each other and make that connection on a psychological level. One of the things I've realized in the, um, you know, the crazy busyness of everyday life, and I seem to be spending hours and hours in Zoom calls and Microsoft Teams calls every day, and it's too easy to tune out. And one of the things that I want to do and my, res my empathy resolution is to make sure that when I'm connecting with someone that I actually get myself into a space 
give myself the time to then be tuned in to them. And I think that's a really important aspect of making that empathic connection. So tuning in. Lovely. Cressida. I like all of your ones. I get into all of your ones. <laughs> wow. Tuning in and listening. And my one as well was uh, a read for empathy resolution. I've got two lists there. Um, and it says, I'm going to continue to read and share books about experiences different from my own. Yes. So. Yes. Oh, yes. And yes, again. Brilliant. <laughs> the whole pile of books here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so finally, my final thing is... Um, I really do have to say thank you. I hate those things where you have endless, endless thank yous, but there are some people we really have to thank. So, um, Cresta, Mohammed, Robin, you are really, really you, amazing. Thank you. And I know we can't hear the audience on Facebook, but I hope we can, you mm -hmm. can hear a virtual clap. Um, secondly, like to say thank you to the audience because I know it will be chock-a-block with our partners, teachers, librarians, all sorts of people doing incredible empathy work out there in the community. We, we see you. And then to the incredible authors and illustrators who led Empathy Day today, videos from their bedrooms, um, empathy charades, Rob Bidoff with an empathy draw along. Uh, they stepped up at such short notice to lead an empathy drive. And I think it will have really lasting results. And then I have to say thank you to the Empathy Lab team. And um, I might get a bit choked up here because they are truly awesome. Being up all night loading videos, um, nearly everybody is a volunteer. It's the tiniest, tiniest of teams. They are truly awesome. So if you'd like to do, if you'd like to help Empathy Lab do more, please get in touch with me. Um, and I've got a thing to hold up to tell you how. We are the tiniest of organisations with the tiniest of budgets. We need a, everything from a sponsor with a million pounds to more activist partners like the Scouts who have just come on board this year. Um, and this is, these are the contact details, um, our website um, and the Twitter handle. So let us resolve to make every day an empathy day. If you live or work with children, um, as Cresta has said, really, simply reading and talking about books through an empathy lens is a really great way forward and a very powerful springboard for helping them um, develop their empathy skills, very natural way, and then to put that into action. There's lots and lots of help on our website. Um, so do use it. We'd love you to. So can I, can I interrupt for one second? Because there's another very, very important thank you to say. And um, that is, of course, to the whole of the Empathy Lab team, but especially to you. None of this would be happening without you. <laughs> and we are so grateful to have the work that you've put in, the energy that you've put in. And let me be also really clear, the empathy that you bring to it every single day. So thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. You'll make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking forward to all of you. We're going to drive an empathy revolution. Let's go do it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>